Hey everyone, happy Sunday. Welcome to the Freedom Exchange. This is Christy and I'm Allison and we have some awesome guests today. We also have a guest producer that happens to be in town. She's she's doing the <laughs> she's what, what over there. Yeah. Um, she doesn't want to be on camera, but she's going to help us out today, which is going to be really great. So what are we doing here? Well, um, do you want me to talk about the Freedom Exchange? I do. I would okay. love you to. All right. So the Freedom Exchange was birthed out of the idea to bridge communities, to have conversations with people that have been incarcerated, that are in prison reform, people that um, know what it's like um, to be inside and um we can squash stigma. We want to talk about the things that happen um, before you go to prison, when people get out, and especially all the amazing things that people are doing now. Um, I, we're really big into bridging those communities. And so um, that's why we're doing these conversations. We're meeting people from all over the country, which we love. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we're, we're just uh, super excited to have you guys on. Who are our guys? Do you want to introduce them? Yes, Starling and Nitschka. Thank you so much much for joining us. We have a mother and daughter duo, which is amazing. Yeah, I love super that. exciting. Do you you guys, guys are so beautiful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we've been talking about how beautiful you are all week. So mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you guys you watching, look at our event page because the pictures, the picture we put up is just like super cool. Ooh, la, la. Yeah. So good. Um, do you tell us where you guys are right now? Where is your body planted in the United States? I'm in Dallas. Yeah. I'm in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Wow. What's the diff? Like, how far does it take? How long does it take to get to each other? Six Driving hours. is like five and yeah, five to six hours, but flying, I think it's like an hour and a half. Oh, that's nice. Do you get oh. to do that very often? Um, well, yeah, but I don't like to drive anymore so much with the kid now. <laughs> it's a different that's drive. Yes. Sorry. But my mom has. Oh, go ahead. I would also say Starlene to our, our audience has a beautiful, sweet little thing. How old is she? She's almost two. Yeah. Mm, perfect. Yeah. So my mom, has, my mom flies out here though, more so now that I had my daughter, she'll come out here and stay. So good. Well, I'm really happy to have you both. I was super excited to meet you and Starlene. We had a great conversation while I was on a walk and we just had it all out. So it was good. And now I'm excited to in, um, include you in the conversation, Nishka. It just, they, they, the conversation dovetails and you belong in this conversation. So um, I can't wait to unfold this whole crazy story of your last many years. Um, I wanted to start with you, Nishka. Could you tell us um, kind of the gist of your story and what led you where you went? Well, the gist of the story is I was at a medical facility in 1995 with Starling and her brother. And um, upon leaving, uh, wanting to get a medical record, there was a new office manager, pretty much begging her for the record um, pertaining to an injury I had in my uh, spine due to a car accident years before that was treated by that particular doctor and um she the other lady who knew me over the years uh was readily agreeing to go and make the little portion of the copy pertaining to my injury and the office manager told her an emphatic no and so I'm pretty much begging so she says if you say that again I'm going to call the police and I'm thinking what did I say so I repeat ma'am may I please have the portion of the medical file pertaining to the injury that the doctor is treating me for currently and so she picks up the phone she dials a 911 dispatch operator she racially profiles me and lies. She says to the 911 dispatch operator that I have a black female here and she's cussing. Mm -hmm. And so I put Starling and my son in the vehicle right in front of the facility door. I wait for the officer to arrive. When he arrives, I stand up, I greet him by mentioning his name on his badge and he asks what's going on. I explain to him then I asked him if he would please ask the lady if she would get the doctor so that um, perhaps he could give the okay to get the medical record and then we'd be on our way, me and my children. And she said to the officer, no. 
And uh, so he suggested that I leave since she is not going to cooperate. So mm -hmm. upon leaving, I mutter under my breath that the woman is an unreasonable expletive, not mm -hmm. for anyone to hear. And so he says to me, come here. And so I lean in checking on my two children right at the facility door in the vehicle. And on the second command, come here, I turn to acknowledge him and he pretty much slammed me into the wall and he lunges his forearm across my chest. I'm lifted off the ground and it's across my chest and under my throat. And so I break loose from him screaming to, uh, for help going to the um, doctor's office door. And he knocks me down, jumps in my back, beats me in my head with uh, steel handcuffs in front of my daughter, who was eight years old at the time. And she's screaming and hollering, I hate you, I hate cops, get off my mommy, get off my mommy, and so forth and so on. And so then I end up uh, being placed on eight years deferred adjudicated probation sentence based on a lie, a fragment of a police report. I mean, it's not even a complete sentence. They just lied. And so I, me and my children, we uh, did six years and nine months of that eight year deferred adjudicated probation sentence only for it to be revoked because I didn't have all the monies. I went to prison, uh, to jail and to prison for $1,700. I would bring in what I could. I do the community service. I did everything, but at six years and nine months, they decided that they were going to send me to prison for mm. non-payment of $1,700. Mm. Wow, he's taking a second to be really frustrated about that. What year was that again? 1995, the uh, police brutality happened, the racial profiling happened. In uh, 2001, it was the, pro the, the deferred adjudicated probation sentence was revoked. And I went to jail and then to prison and I was uh, close, I was like eight months, almost eight months pregnant when I went to jail. And then by the time they transferred me mm. to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice system, um, I was, eight months close to giving birth to my son, my wow. younger son. Wow. Was the, um, so we know what the conversation around police brutality is right now in our current landscape and on the news, it's like, you know, it's the thing right now, but back then, was there a conversation around it? Was it something anybody looked twice at? Well, in 1992, I remember uh, Rodney King being brutally beaten by police officers in the street and that was caught on video. Right. Okay, um, I wasn't privy to the criminal justice system. I was focused on going to school. You know, I, I wasn't, that wasn't what I was thinking about, but I do recall 1992. Right. when that horrific ordeal happened in Los Angeles, California. Okay, and Starling, can you share um, just your memory of that day and what sort of was embedded in your body after experiencing that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I still pretty much remember that day very vividly. Um, I do know I wasn't in the doctor's office when I do, I was in the car. Like she said, my mom was like, get in the car. And we were literally right on the curb, right outside. And I was buckling my brother into the back seat. And I see this cop car, like hang a corner and hit the curb and go up. Like he's about to like come down in a robbery or a murder or something like that. And he hops out the car and I'm like, what's going on? You know, but I'm still trying to do what my mom said and put my brother in the car and um, the next thing I know is I see my mom, I mean, a few minutes later, I see my mom, like, push the door open to, like, speak to me, and the next thing I know is she's, like, snatched back by the cop, and so I leave my brother in the backseat, because that's all I knew to do, and took off running, and open up the door, and I see this cop, like, on top of my mom, just, like, pounding her in the head, so I immediately start screaming, you know, get off my mom, get off my mom, like, I hate you, I hate cops, um, and after that, I kind of really, I don't it, like stuff kind of slowed down. I really don't remember too much of what was said, but I do remember um, being at the police station and 
they were taking pictures of this cop's face. And I think he had like, it was very, it was very pink and red. I remember that, but he had like a small scratch on his face and they were literally laughing about what had happened. And then I hear them um, talking about my mother, like saying, why didn't anyone tell me she had this going on or that she had, you know, mental health or this, this. And I'm like, you literally just beat the crap out of my mom and y'all think this is funny and you are joking about it. So from that moment, my life with law enforcement completely changed. I never looked at cops as good or that they help people or that they will help in any kind of situation. I, I And, you know, at the time, um, like my mom said, I was still so young. I do remember the Rodney King, but it just wasn't, we didn't have cell phones. I recorded. It just wasn't prevalent. You, you yeah. didn't get to catch you know, bad cops doing these things. They didn't have body cams or um, things of that nature. So I, you know, it just was kind of, this is what happened. And then next thing I know, my mom was on probation and then that, that was just the life we adjusted to. So for me, um, from that moment, I always had a fear of cops. And then when my mom became incarcerated, I, that fear was exasperated into going to jail because I'm like, if this can happen to my mom, this can happen to me. So I thought, you know, that's why I lived my life in this way of like this being the number one thing. I cannot go to jail. I cannot get arrested. I cannot, you know, do anything that will involve the cops and definitely don't call them if they, if you need help, because they don't come for that. You, you shared with me kind of your trajectory from that moment on when you were growing up. And do you want to share about that kind of how you tried to stay the straight line and do the right thing and all the things you were accomplishing in your goals as you were growing up? Yeah. I mean, I was, I'm already, I, I'm already an overachiever. I would say in spite of that happening, but um, you know, I, I thought that well, let me just try to live right. Let me go to college, which was something I wanted to do. So I can't say that this like fueled that, right? But it was like, if I do this, if I go to school, if I graduate, get my degree, get a job, start working, like I will avoid this, this penal system because, you know, it wasn't just, that was the first step into it. But then um, you, my mom goes to prison while she's pregnant, right? And I'm 15 years old in high school. And so I have to go live with family. And then my aunt, my mom's sister, and I have to fly to Galveston to go pick up my brother only being three days old, you know? And so now I'm, I mean, I had guardians, but I'm also responsible for helping my aunt with my younger brothers. So it just was a lot of weight on me. And then, you know, my mom is telling me, writing me, different things, um, which was her outlet. She was venting, right? Cause she didn't really have anybody else that she could talk to. And I didn't get to talk to her on the phone. I don't know, maybe mom, I don't remember talking to you on the phone like that, maybe once or twice. So it was all through letters. Um, so, you know, I just tried to stay straight and then um, thought I did everything that I could. I mean, there was a situation in college when I, it's, you know, it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So I was in a domestic violent relationship and um, went, was, went to jail and the cops never helped me then. They never asked me what happened. I mean, I had black and blue eyes. My hair was cut. I had burns all over my body. Nobody asked me anything about what happened to me. So that just kept, you know, triggering that, the law enforcement is not on our side regardless. Um, and then 15 years later, um, you know, found myself indicted by the feds. And it, it's crazy because I do remember I wrote, and my mom sent this to me, I wrote, I have a picture that I posted. Um, I wrote, I drew out a picture to my mom when she was incarcerated when I was 15 and I said, keep your head up. And, um, she sent that back to me when I was in a holding center in Pahrump and it was, I was just like bawling, crying. Cause I'm like, look at this, you know, it's crazy. And it's, it's one of those things. It's like, how does something, how does the system implement itself and to continue to implement itself into generations of families when we, we weren't drug dealers, we weren't, you know, whatever these, you know, fraud or all these different things, which people can commit to go to prison. Like we're not doing that. Right. And we're still finding ourselves incarcerated and dealing with the trauma. So I'm at a point now where it's like, how do I stop this? Cause now I have a daughter, right? It's like, how do I stop this? And I know my mom thought she did everything to try 
to raise me right, which she did. You know, I'm, I'm still successful and doing great things. Um, but yeah, that, and I can talk about my documentary a, a little bit later, but that's what I'm trying to explore is how this system um, implements itself into generations of families the way that it does. And that's a big weight to carry, you know, like, like you said, when you're talking about the generational um, aspect of it, that's a big weight to carry. Say, how, how can I make sure this doesn't happen to my family with my, with my child? That's a big, it's weight. hard. It's hard. Cause I yeah. think a lot of parents, like my mom, you know, I'm sure she, she carried that weight once I was incarcerated and I kept telling her, I would talk to her and be like, mom, this is, I'm at the camp. Okay. It's a little bit, a little cupcake kind of fairy over here. It's not the TDC state Wait. Texas prison that you were in. So I would always try to like ease her mind when I talked to her on the phone, even though I was dealing with a lot um, at the facilities that I was at, you know, I tried to ease her mind because I know she kept replaying in her mind, this type of stuff that she went through. Um, and I know that was heavy on her as well as a parent. Um, just for a little more insight into who you guys are outside of your story, I can start with you, Nishka, but um, who were you in the prison community? Like what role did you play in the, the women around you? Did that yeah, make sense? you know how the saying is you find Jesus when you go to jail. <laughs> well, right. That wasn't my case. I knew and walked with the Lord, had a strong relationship with the Lord prior to being incarcerated. So the role I played in the community within uh, the carceral system was that of leader. And I helped the women around me. I helped them. There was a lady who was cold. I mean, just shivering in the jail. Okay, I get her a sweatshirt from the commissary. You, you can't hand it over, but sit it at the table while we're sitting there having Bible study. That's for you, mm -hmm. you know? And then there was one young lady who wanted to stab me with a pen while I was pregnant and we were in this cage. And so I pressed the button and I asked for the CO to come out, you know, let me out so she could calm down. So I went out and I explained to the CO, I want to address the, I don't know what they call the squad, wherever we were in that cage, I want to address the ladies there. And she allowed me to do that, to let them know that we're in here, we cannot leave here. So we're going to have to be more understanding and more uh, compassionate towards one another. Yeah. And so the young lady who wanted to stab me with the pen, I asked her when I went back into that cage, we, I had the top bunk, big and pregnant top bunk and she had the bottom yeah. at any rate. Um, yeah, that was difficult. Um, at any rate. So I tell her, listen, we're going to go out here and we're going to hush this talk about any violence taking place in here. So I want you to stand up there with me. The CO already said that we can do this. So you and I are going to shut it down and let these ladies know that you and I have no problems. There's a misunderstanding. Okay. Mm -hmm. And don't ever take a pen to me ever again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do yeah. Do do this. You know, but yeah. that's, that's what, it, that was the role that I played as leadership and helping the women, um, having Bible study. I knew it was like, okay, God, when I asked for help, um, and asking my mother if she would please get a lawyer to um, try to get that probation reinstated. And she says to me, Nichka, are you afraid? Mm. That's my one jail call. And I said, no, mom, God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Let me go see what God is doing in my life. Mm. Because I knew at that point, that wasn't help that my mom could do for me financially or what have you. So I had made up my mind, okay, God, this is your will for me right now. So this is where I'm going. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, I, I have a question about the money. Cause I don't know if our audience would know. So why did you owe money? I owed money because all I could pay while on probation was like $20 here, $50 here, $30 here. I do whatever I could financially. Pay towards. And, and what was the, what were was you it paying a fine? Towards. What was it? A fine? Um, 
I, it was the fees, whatever. I don't, I don't know exactly. I have the records and everything. I don't know exactly right now off the top of my head exactly what it was. All I know is about $1,700 that I was still behind after serving six years and nine months. I was in school working on my master's degree. I so was people, just shy, huh? I was going to say, people don't realize that when those sorts of things happen, there's fines, there's fines, there's fees, there's restitution. So it's not just like, you know, you're on probation and you just have to stay out of trouble. There's this whole other. Yeah, it's money involved. It's money involved. And then there was, yeah. yeah, there's money involved. And then there was an election. So you're reelecting your judges, you're reelecting your DAs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're doing this, re, this election. So this is the election time that they decide to revoke. You mm. see, so however that works politically, that's a mechanism that is done in the system. That's why it's all systemic. Mm -hmm. So it all works and, and correlates together in caging people and, and, and setting up ways where it, they're going to fail. The system is failing the individuals. It's not correctional. It's not um, restorative. It's none of those things. It's, it's penal. It's, it's business. Penal. It's, it's penal. It's political. Yeah. It's 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 a sad systemic mass incarceration monster. Is what it yeah, is. It's easy to get involved, and it's hard to get. It's almost out. impossible to get out. Yes, and especially depending on who's you know who's in the political system, their constituents, hey, we're tough on crime. Like, what does that mean? People don't, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there's so much about I that. tried to pay that whole amount off um, just to get it out of the way, but that didn't happen. I had asked for help and I didn't have the help to do it. So I did the best I could. I just knew Sorry. people would want to know, like, well, what are you paying? Yeah. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was, there was not a fraud issue. There wasn't. So I, I well, and I have a friend right now that's, um, the charges are still being figured out what this person's going to be charged with, and they have to pay for all the counseling and all the appointments and all of the um, drug tests and all of the everything that he has to go through. He's, he's, he's getting billed yeah. all along the way yet he lost his job and I know there's consequences to you know unlawful behavior but it starts to build up it there's so much they're requiring him to do right now and it's just building and building and it's just becoming yeah it's big business. for a young person right now it's big business. So just, it's big business. just to touch on what you said Christy I don't think people understand to especially I'm not for sure for state but in the federal system, you have to start paying those fees while incarcerated. Yes. So if you are not, if you don't have, and they base it off the money that you get on your books, right? So let's say, for instance, it's Christmas time and I got a lot of people that gave me some money, but I don't get that money all the time. They base my fees off of how much people are putting on my books. And then if you don't have anybody putting on anything on your books, they take that money out of the sense that you are making, basically doing slave work while you're incarcerated. And so for me, when I, I, won my appeal. And then finally, when the feds overturned my case and dismissed everything, I called the courthouse and asked them to reinstate me my money that I had been paying. And the woman, actually, my attorney told me to call because he's like, I don't know, you call him first before I try to do this. And so I called and the woman was such in shock of what I was asking for. She literally got an attitude with me on the phone. And I was like, well, my all of my charges have been overturned. I need to be reimbursed for all of the money I have been paying these last two years. Absolutely. So she said, Right. So she said, well, your attorney has to present that to the judge, which he did, thankfully. But they, they had never heard of such a thing. And I don't even think people, you know, people who win their appeal and are immediate release in those type of ways, I don't think, you know, they understand that they even have the rights to do that. Young. So it yeah. makes too much sense. And why would anybody give you pushback on that? You didn't do the thing and they were wrong. And, and why should yeah. you even have to ask for it back? Yes. Yes. Here you go. <laughs> Here's your <laughs> Here's your paperwork and here's the money that we took from you that you won your appeal on. So did they you would have never back? given it back. No, they huh? didn't. Did you get it back? Yes, I did. I, oh, I ended up they sending me a money order um with interest? like months and months yeah. later. No, with interest. <laughs> no, I didn't get interest. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the question I asked your mom and um and Nichka, I didn't just hear leadership, I heard absolute motherhood in what how you were describing that, like a mom 
in there. Well, on that note, I want to say something too on that is that um, I know when I first got to Carswell in Texas, I had already been in two, two years or so, but it's after I got sentenced. And so I, you know, you don't know what to expect. I'm, I thought I was going to camp in California and I ended up going to maximum security in Texas. I remember, I, I remember those ladies that did those types of things that you're talking about. It makes me emotional. I remember the lady that started singing a gospel song that I had never heard that now, every time I listen to, I get very, it was, it's almost like this blanket. I don't want to sing Kumbaya, but it feels like a blanket of love. Like I'm going to be okay. There's someone here that is like, not going to be like super mean to me. And there, there's something about their heart that my heart attaches to, and I'm going to be okay. And I, I specifically remember their names. I remember what they, you know, everything about them because they, it's, it's so, it's such a contrast to what prison's about. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you did that is, um, I'm sure that carried weight and still does to, yeah. to the women in there. It's a big good. deal. And the Jesus thing too. I was like, I am not finding Jesus in jail. That's disgusting. <laughs> but he totally had other plans. And so, um, but, but I remember that thought because yeah, you hear about that in the <laughs> movies and it's like, well, honey, he has your undivided attention. And I said, well, that is true. So we'll put it down to it. Right. But anyway, it's, I just had to throw that no, in good. there because it's true. I remember those ladies and yeah, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, loving thing in a really horrific environment. Well, and it doesn't have to end there. I'm sure that you remember those and you are that for people now because you knew how impactful it was yes, in your yeah. own, in your own yes, way. Girl. No, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, your, your turn, Starling, who were you while you were in the camp? Um, okay. So just to give a little context. So you heard my mom's story. Um, and because she took a plea, although she did nothing wrong, she took a plea, right? So going through my case prior, um, I was on pretrial for a year and a half, battling anxiety, depression, all of these things from dealing with um, this case. But I refused to take a plea because the plea had nothing applicable to me. Um, there was money that wasn't mine. I mean, millions of dollars, cars, Range Rovers, Benzes, uh, mansions. I mean, pounds of wheat, stuff that was not mine. So at the very end of the plea deal, and this is what they do. They give dummy plea deals, and especially to women, especially if you can't afford representation, right? Um, at the end of that plea deal, out of all this stuff, it was like five pages. It says, if you take this plea, if you sign this plea, you will give up all your appeal rights. Mm. And I, and something just did not resonate. I'm like, I can't, I wanted to do it, sign it, get it over with. But I told myself, look at what they did to your mother. And I'll be damned. I said, if I'm going to do time in prison, we're going to, to war with this because I'm not just going to sign over my rights to y'all. So if y'all, they wanted me to sign for two years. If y'all want me to give away my rights for two years, well, y'all going to have to take me to trial and, and force me to go to prison for two years. So I ended up doing the two years, but because I did not sign that deal, the government superseded the indictment and charged me with 13 more counts. So I was originally only facing one. And then about three weeks before my trial was to start, I was looking at over 100 years if I was sentenced to the max on each of those. So I, prior, I was trying to pursue my dreams and, and follow my passions, but I couldn't focus on anything really. I was married, you know, at the time, um, I was living in Atlanta trying to, you know, I was writing for a bunch of different magazines while working, um, but I just really didn't have that focus. I had to get closer with God. I had a prayer closet and I, and I said, look, God, I don't read this Bible every day, but I need you to talk to me through this thing right now because I don't know how to how to battle this and this is not my fight so I literally remember being in my prayer closet and there was a stack of papers that the government has sent um, the discovery which is the evidence that um, they're supposed to give to you once you get indicted and I remember looking at those papers and people probably would think I was crazy and I said in the name of Jesus all of these weapons that are trying to form against me through these documents right now will be cast into the sea because I don't know and I'm not that good as far as like reciting the exact Bible verses, but I do know that God says in his word that if you believe it in your heart, then you will be free. Like if you believe what you are praying for right now, then it will come to pass. Now, people don't talk about the process that gets you got to go through for it to pass. There's a lot so, in between there that happens. <laughs> a lot. 
crazy. Right, right. So it didn't come to pass in the way that I thought. I thought I was going to walk out of that courtroom and be free and I was going to win and, the, and, you know, and justice shall prevail. Absolutely not. But in the end, God's justice prevailed, right? I still am free. I don't have any convictions. All of those charges against me were overturned. Mm -hmm. So going in, and I'm not even going to front, like I was so depressed. I was trading orange juice for sleeping pills. Like I'm not even going to lie. It took me a minute to come to terms with all of this while I was incarcerated, they sent me to, I was, my case was in California. So I was in Fresno County. They sent me to Fresno County jail, which is the sister jail to Alcatraz. So literal bars, like old school built in 1942, literal bars in this, in this facility. And I just remember after them processing me in and I'm walking this green mile with everything hmm. that I own to my name within this, in this uh, pillowcase, right? Mm -hmm. And I just remember when, they, when the, that door slid open and I'm just looking and I'm like, I have no idea how I'm gonna get through this, right? Cause all I have to base it off of the stories that my mother has told me and stuff I've seen on TV. Like, am I gonna have to fight? Are there somebody gonna try to rape me? Am I gonna, you know, you just, all these things that go through your mind when you're when you when you've never been through it and i remember walking in and the way it was set up there was there were the cells were open and there was four beds two bunks in each one and i just remember walking in and i i went there was cell it was cell 11 i remember seeing 11 cuz i'm like they're like oh go find somewhere to lay down and i'm like oh, okay um so i start walking and god tells me go back i see cell 11 but i keep walking and i just hear a voice say go back go back. And so I turned around and I went and there was um, three ladies. One was on the bottom. She was up. The other two, um, the other two ladies were sleeping and her name was sister Vicky. I didn't know that at the time. And I said, um, is it okay if I come in here? <laughs> and, you know, cause I'm trying to be respectful. I don't want nobody, you know, I don't know. This is not my home. So she looks at me <laughs> and she goes, we don't play none of that mess in here. And I said, I don't play none of that mess either. So I'm right where I need to be. Aww. And <laughs> she was a godly woman. Her name, her name was Sister Vicky. She was the woman who prayed for everybody. I mean, people, the women were coming to our cell, um, getting prayer from her daily. And it honestly built me up to be, I didn't even know I had the capacity to be a prayer warrior, to pray for women in that way. So being around her in the short time that I was, um, it, it built me and it gave me the strength to continue to get through the rest of that journey. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy how in such a dark, horrific, scary, I mean, I can imagine you walking and your knees are shaking, you know, you're like, yeah, I remember I went to lay my head down at the new place and the lady goes, well, she said some other words I won't say on here, but she's like, <laughs> she said, that's where my head lays. And so I'm like, oh God, I don't know what, you know, you don't know what to do. You don't want to step on anybody's toes. But then when you meet that person that is a kind and gentle and you feel safe with, I mean, that's, that's huge in a place like that. Mm -hmm. And God, I mean, the work that he does in there is it's, it's long lasting. I think that's a great segue. It is. What are we talking so about? So we should, let's talk about, um, you know, who you were before and after seems a little, but how do I say it? Um, you did change. You went through a major life experience that a lot of people haven't gone through. And then you come out and you've, you know, you're walking around and nobody knows you've been there. If you're just walking in a grocery store or walking down the street, yet you have this really, really profound experience you've just been through that has changed you and shaped you. And, um, we talk about it being your superpower. It's giving you something special and unique that most people don't have. So what would you say are the most profound things um, that shifted in you after that experience that have led you to, which we will get to right after this, where you're headed now? Um, it just, while I was there, I, I could say I just got really laser focused on myself and what my purpose in this life was um I always you know would be pouring myself into other people because that's just what kind of person I am I want to see everybody accomplish their dreams and on top of that having to keep your household together and pay bills and you know um so there I can't say as horrific as it was it was the first time I didn't have to pay rent 
It was the first time I didn't have to cook food. It was the first time I didn't even have to worry about what I was going to put on the next day. So I was able to really just go within myself and figure out what is it that I want to do? What is God calling me to do? Um, so I got that focus. I started that work before I ever even got released. So while I was there, um, I wrote and wrote and wrote, you know, I'm, I'm a writer first. I wrote and wrote and wrote. And then I, when I, by the time I was released, I had uh, six feature scripts written. I had two books and three shorts. So by the time I got out and I'm grateful because a lot of women and this needs to be discussed and talked about don't have support when they are released, right? Um, they don't have family, everybody's long gone. They don't know where their children are, but I wasn't in that situation. I had family support. So I was able to get my life back together. I also didn't have to have that um, F on my chest, right? Because my stuff was being, it was in the process of being overturned. So I was able to kind of go back into my career without having to worry about stuff coming up and having to answer about these things. Um, so at first I didn't think it was a superpower. Now that you say that it is, I kind of do have a superpower, but I didn't look at it that way um, because I had a lot of PTSD. Um, it took me a while and I still deal in battle with those things. Um, keys would trigger me, uh, loud sounds would trigger me. Um, you know, somebody yelling would trigger me like, because there is it, so much noise, right? In those places, it's so much noise all the time, all the time. So after I was able to kind of get a little bit more adjusted, um, I became more social and just focused on my film stuff and my writing. And um, I think it is a superpower in the fact that nobody knows until you tell them. So using your voice to speak and also, it also lets people know like, hey, one, this is happening, this is real. And two, like there are so many other women like me, like myself that are in this situation. And in, you know, I'll honestly say, I had no idea that my documentary was gonna even go into pre-production this year. It's been something I've been working on, but because I put together a three year freedom anniversary video and put it out on social media, my uh, crew from another show that I write on hit me up and was like, we had no idea that this happened to you. Like, this is the type of stories we wanna be telling. And I'm like, oh really? Wow, like, okay, let's do it. So. I feel like I know not all women are able to speak about their experiences because some women, I mean, I've heard, I've heard the worst of the worst and I'm grateful that I had, I didn't have to go through that. Like even now I just saw a video last night in Coleman, um, a young woman serving time there was raped by a prison guard and was pregnant and she fears for her life right now because she spoke out. And I mean, how can you cover up a pregnancy, right? And he's gonna get out before she even gets out. So it's like, those are the type of things that I feel like I have to use my voice for. And I have to keep telling my story to inspire others and for other women to come out and share their story. And that's why I, my mom had a lot of undealt with trauma over all these years. She never talked about it. She never dealt with it. Nobody really gave a damn to ask her anything about it. And so when I was given a platform, I extended that platform to her. Thank you There's so much I wanna say, and I want you to address something, but first I wanna hear from Nitschka about your superpower and how that looks in your life now. Um, my superpower is purpose. Mm -hmm. And I look at everything as purposeful. There's no mistakes. There's no mistakes. Things happen to us. We go through hell, we come back. But we take that and we use it to extend um, compassion and love towards others and help them in their uh, problematic situation, especially dealing with incarceration for women and girls. Mm -hmm. You know, um, self-respect. And that, this is what I instilled in my children. You have self-respect and I've always believed in them and I've always shared that with them. And I never compared my children. They each have their own giftings and I just nurture that. I nurture it, I just nurture it. That's a gift God gave me. When I see giftings in others, I nurture that. They don't have to be my biological children. Mm -hmm. I see something. And it's like, you know what? You need to hone in on that gift. 
because yeah. that gift will make room for you. Mm. So that is my superpower is purpose. I, I, I find purpose in everything, good, bad, or indifference. Okay. Isn't that amazing? I mean, every human being in the whole world needs purpose. And so many people are, are seeking it and, and, and can't find or it feeling, or don't know how to, uh, how to grab it. Feeling stuck or unsettled, but not knowing what it is and what it probably is, is purpose. Feeling like they don't know what to do, but they, they don't know where to go, but they don't like where they're at. I, before we can forget all this, I want you to address, um, that concept of not talking about it or talking about it and what comes from I, I experienced a father in prison that didn't talk about it and he died in his shame. He died alone. He died disconnected. Um, he died miserable from Which affected just you. Not, letting, not letting himself grow and learn from what he went through. And then it affected my whole life. Um, but you're so big on sharing it, which you weren't going to do, but you did pretty quick. But I just want you to share the, the power and whether it's incarceration or anything else that we can have shame in what happens when we well I was never a share that's I think one of the reasons I ended up in prison because I could have asked for help I could have said okay I am going down this road and people wanted to help me but I was never a share I I, I just thought um, sharing is weak I got to keep it to myself I'm strong I can handle things I'm a people pleaser like Darling was talking about I'll I'll help anyone who needs help and I'm good because if you're gonna help me or have a say in what I'm doing, then I'm gonna have to look at my emotional state and I wasn't ready to, you know. And so in prison, I I um I got broken hard a couple times. I ended up getting kicked out of RDAP twice and I and right before I was gonna leave, I had to do another year. They said I was inauthentic. There was no progress. They said, thank God you can't be a mother because you would be terrible. So it was those hardcore things that got me angry. Like, like I was angry. I had no idea the hatred and the anger that I can have in my body. I was always light. So because of that, and well, when I first got out, I said, I wasn't going to share still. Cause I just, I would, you know, I, why would you, why would you tell anybody you were in prison? You just move on and you do well. And then I got, I got, I relocated to Oregon from California. And I feel like God really placed me in the place of super loving, healing, um, seekers, people that were interested. And whenever I just said one little thing, like with you it was the first time I met you when you picked me up from a Bible study. And I was like, Oh God, she's probably thinking here's this convict in my car. And, but you were interested in my what dad I had was a convict. Well, I didn't know that. I just thought you were giving this poor girl a ride. And so I thought, and so we talked about it and you were so interested in this in, in it. So I was like, Oh, and it gave me freedom to just to let a little out. And each time I let a little more out and then people started telling me their secrets and then it just got bigger and bigger. And I was able to release more shame and people kept coming up to me like, wow, thank you for sharing my father or my brother, or I'm facing prison. It just kept growing and growing. And each time more specifically, I got um, relief. I got more connected to Christy. I was more connected to who I am. And so now I'm, I'm so connected to who I am now, or if I want, if there's things I'm not sure about still, I can talk to my people and say, I'm feeling this way here, you know, which, which, you do. which I do all the time, <laughs> but, and then I, and it, and it transcends prison. It, it really, you know, yeah. it, it transcends. So when people are going through stuff, I can, you know, like, you going through stuff it's like it sucks and it's hard and it's gonna get worse but i promise it's gonna get better and because i've shared my shameful experience you trust me mm -hmm. and then it it it, it and then it, i say oh boy i got a story for you too yeah and, and then now you have a story and then great. the whole and then it just keeps going and that's yeah. why we're doing what we're doing with you guys because it is our superpower because it connects us back to ourselves. As soon as we cut something off to say, mm, I'm not going to talk about that. It's, it's who it's part of us, you know? So, so you're denying a part of you. And yeah. And I, and I, and I, and I'm judging it. And if I'm going to judge something about myself, I'm certainly going to judge you all day long. So if I'm not judging what I went through and just yeah. believe that it was for a better purpose, like you said, Starling, God, I think, 
you're like, hey, if we're going to let me out of this, let's do it this way. So, mm -mm, that's not the way it's going to work. And it's going to work this way, which is deeper and more beautiful and harder a lot of times too. I would say you would not be where you are today talking to judges and senators and pass writing and passing bills and being approached by filmmakers and the list goes on. And none of that would, not one of those things would happen if you were quiet about everything, because that's what's fueling your superpower is what's fueling all of those opportunities. So this is our great segue. I want to start oh, with- you're getting good at with this. With <laughs> Nishka, I want to, you have, what are your projects? What are your things right now? Um, so I just got um, the biggest grant I've ever, well, I don't even think I ever got a grant. My first and biggest grant um, <laughs> from Austin Film Society um, to begin production on my documentary called Black Butterflies. So we are, we have a fundraising campaign. So anybody who's listening, if you want to give even $5, you can go to blackbutterfliesdoc.com. Um, you can watch a little snippet on what it will be. We are in super pre-production um i'm still putting together storylines and all of those things but i'm just super grateful i'm not rushing it thank I'm you so i'm not rushing you wow. uh, it's so exciting i'm not even rushing the process like i have to tell myself to chill out like because my brain is like oh i need to be doing this 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 and i'm like some of the best documentaries that you see out there took years to make and so um i'm just happy to have a team you know the team that uh I, there's a show filmed here in Dallas called Wash. We were Emmy nominated uh, over the summer. That was a writer for uh, season two. So I have that crew, that team, they're backing me. Um, and I'm just excited. I mean, we're really just gonna expose the injustices that happen to women across the board. Um, there's so many different kind of injustices that happen while we're in this criminal legal system process from the onset all the way to um, post-incarceration. So we're gonna dive deep into that and also the generational curses and trauma that this system uh, implements itself into. So yeah, that's my, my big <laughs> number one right now project. Well, thank so you. Exciting. We will get to follow all of that because now you're our thing. And I wanna say one thing with that. Someone told me, um, that um, because I was writing a book and I was, you know, pressured of trying to get this thing, you know, to an agent and stuff. And she goes, Christy, just relax. She said, this is the only time in your whole life that you're going to write a first book. So enjoy every day. So that's what I'm saying to you. This is the Thank only you. time that you're going to experience a first grant. So yes, enjoy that journey, you know, cause it's true. Life is today too. So yeah. yeah. And that grant that it also showed me that, um, other people are interested in finding out about, and they want to know about this, right? Because I didn't, I, I literally just put everything together the way that they wanted me to format it and sent a video that I literally shot on my phone in the house during the pandemic and got this money. So don't sleep on yourself is what I should say to people. <laughs> sleep on yourself. Good. I love that. Good. Okay. It's your turn. Nichka. My turn what, to- What are you up to? What are you up to? What yeah, is all these girls doing big stuff? I know, I love it. Oh, what I'm up to, God has brought everything full circle for me. Uh, 24 years later, again, I was nine semester credits uh, shy of finishing my Master of Public Affairs at UTD, University of Texas at Dallas. And then, you know, post-incarceration, life is not easy, re-entry is not easy. So what I'm doing now, I'm earning my executive master of public administration degree at the Nelson Mandela School of Government and Social Sciences at Southern University in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mm. Yeah, and um, I'm also working on a book, my manuscript, which I started while in prison Mm. And like Starling mentioned, things take time. It, it takes time. So just, you know, and I think I'm able to write better now instead of wetting up all of my pages with tears as I write since going through, um, you know, the loam and talking about having that safe space, that non judgmental space to be able to let it out. You know, so I'm grateful to my daughter for introducing me to that space because I needed that. So I'm I'm free. I'm unshackled. I'm okay. Awesome. I'm okay. Yeah, I'm shout applying. out to the loan. Yes, I'm okay. applying for a full uh, a full pardon, which I started in 2019. However, with the pandemic, 
Um, they lost things. They had high turnover with the Board of Pardons and Paroles, so they had high turnover. So I talked to the director and he says, well, just change the date. You don't have to do everything all over. And I have to account for 40 years of uh, employment, which I don't have, but they just want to know what I was doing and where I was. So I'll let them know. <laughs> so hopefully those things will get completed you know and i just want to say i'm so proud of you mom and also uh shout out to the loan because i was in the faces of women in prison inaugural cohort ooh, came to talk, inaugural cohort and um i'm now employed with them as a digital communications manager and my mother the cohort that she is in is a specific cohort that is funded by the NFL that focuses specifically on women impacted by police brutality, which is something that we need to raise awareness about even more because it's always looked at as a men's issue. Um, but when women are often, their interactions with law enforcement is often violent as well. So that's, that's it. You guys that's are my shameless plug. <laughs> no, not shameless. No, that's awesome. great. <laughs> Isn't there a graduation coming up too soon? For yeah. Yeah. Yep. Mom. Yeah. She's graduating uh, Friday. Friday, yeah. October. Um, on my drive for 15th, I think. I have to go yeah. You get to do a little speech. You get to do a talk. Yeah. 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 Congratulations. Awesome. So I'm excited. Good. I feel so blessed. You know, I mean, yes, I would say I would never want to go through what I went through again, but because you can't go back like that, um, the amount of amazing people that we get to meet that we can call friends from around the country is just, there's, there's, there's really no price that you can put on mm -hmm. that. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I, I feel really for, fortunate with that. Thank you, you are so right. Well, we're getting, we're so we're getting texts and we're getting comments on Facebook. We're, I'm getting <laughs> personal texts right now from certain people in Atlanta and tell um, us to hurry up because yeah, they want to get to you're our watching just and we want to get to our speed round. But first, let's, oh, what? let's introduce or bring our, our guest producer closer. Oh, so I think there's a question. Lisa? I have a friend here that I've been friends. Oh, we're not supposed to. I'm sorry. It's okay. She's secret. She's not she's she's secret. She busted she's out. She's my of friend from, from 42 years yes. ago that we've been friends since we were kids. Okay, so here's a question, you guys, that we got on Facebook. Daniel Aaron Roman asks, talk a little bit about how guards objectify women. Did you hear that? Mm-mm. How do guards, how do guards objectify women? There's a whole, that. Ooh, what did you, what did you, do we have time to go into that? No, we, we don't really have time. We think do. All what do you mean everything. objectify? Clarify that for me. Objectify. Like make, like make fun of, call names, you know, Bring comment on small. their. Okay. Ass, I have one whereby I was, um, I was in the pill line. And I thought the lady was leaving from the window to get her meds and I stepped over the little yellow line. So the CO told me, he says, um, hey, you get your ass back in line. And so I said, sir, may I approach you? I'd like to ask you a question. He said, yeah, what is it? So I approached him and I said, sir, um, can you please explain to me what my ass has to do with anything you're asking me to do right now? Yeah, girl, <laughs> yes. You know, it's respect. And so I explained to him, I said, sir, I don't cause any problems. I'm not going to disrespect anyone. I wasn't aware. I thought the lady was leaving and I stepped over the line. So I apologize for that. But um, I'm going to ask you to respect me as I respect you. And how that go? Yeah, and what did he say? I'm okay. curious. Okay, he has a wife that was working there and was pregnant and I explained to him, you wouldn't want your wife yeah. to be concerned about what's coming out of your mouth pertaining to my ass. So, Ooh. and she was a very nice CO. She was a very nice CO. Yeah. So, you know, I said that to him and every time I saw him on that walk, you know, he kind of dropped his head. So yeah, it's self-respect. Ooh, that's crazy. It. But then what happens a lot of times from that is that then you get to your cell and your locker and your lockers turned up and all yep. the other lockers yep. turned up and that mm -hmm. extra bowl that you have in there is mm -hmm. identified as something to get a shot. I mean, it goes, it's, it's scary. So it is. I mean, and, and I, I, and I can say, and I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'll briefly talk about mine, but I was strip searched very inappropriately by a woman guard who was gay 
lesbian and I felt that was inappropriate for her if she's attracted to the same thing why are you allowing her if you wouldn't allow a man to strip search um us why would you allow her to strip search us and I mean it was just over the top you know take off this take your ponytail out wiggle your toes squat just extraness that I hadn't had to go through you know dealing with anybody else at that facility and I wrote wrote that guard up and of course I got flack for it but Nothing really happened, but she stopped being a visitation is what where she okay. did okay. that at. So good for yeah. you guys. Those stories can go on and on, on and on. Okay. More just comment. Okay, so we're gonna do a speed round. So this is just because um we love everything that we've talked about and it's a heavy topic. And I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times when I'm done talking about certain things, I have almost like a little emotional hangover. Cause it's, you know, we talk about it like it's just, you know, a regular story and it is, but it's also a lot of people don't talk about their most shameful or their hard story. So we, we try to lighten it up a little bit at the end with some questions. So these are just like one word answers or so. Okay. Um, so each of you can answer this. Um, Starling, lemon or chocolate? Chocolate. Oh yeah, me too. What about you, Nitschka? Chocolate. Okay. I said, what if, what if you're lemon and chocolate? That's what I'm <laughs> you're lemon or chocolate? All of it. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Starling, what advice would you give your young self? Like say your- Like your daughter. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. <laughs> um, I would say never doubt yourself mm -hmm. and always listen to your inner voice because that is the one that is the most truthful and the right one. Mm -hmm. I agree. Imagine if we could do that, that'd be amazing. What about you, Nitschka? I believe in you is what I tell my young self. I yeah. believe in you. I love that. Okay, Nitschka, on a scale from one to 10, how cool are you? How cool am I? On a scale from one to 10? <laughs> oh, I am a 10. Woo! Don't play. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking too. What about you, Starling? I'm a 20. I'm, I'm <laughs> like, cooler than cool. <laughs> you you have your it. own scale. You get your <laughs> own scale. <Yes. system> <laughs> okay, um, Nitschka, what's your hidden talent? My hidden talent is um, seeing talent and gifts in others mm -hmm. and nurturing that. I yeah. love that. I, I can the world that. needs that for yeah. sure. What about you, Starling? Um, I have two actually. One is that I can crochet because that's what I learned to do while I was incarcerated. <laughs> what did you my crochet? Other? Did you crochet a bear or a blanket? No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't touch the bears. Blankets, oh. backpacks, booties, hats. I stuck to the, to the stuff I knew how to do. I got some <laughs> other, stuff there for me. I do. And my other hidden talent, I know I wish I had the time to do it now, but I, I'll save that when I get older, um, is that I like to freestyle in the car by myself. Oh. Can we be, can we pretend like we're in a car right now? Come no, on. no. <laughs> hidden, hidden talent. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, keep it there. oh, that's awesome. I hey, wish I could do that. that was a good hidden talent, but we'll call you later in a little bit. To okay. Get <laughs> okay. Um, Starling, where do you want your next vacation to be? If it was, if you could choose anywhere in the world. Um, uh, Cuba. Cuba. Nice. What about you, Nitschka? Dubai, baby. Oh, that would be nice. That's I want to go one. shoe shopping. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say Milan, Italy, go get some shoes. But Dubai is, I want to go to Dubai. Awesome. Dubai will have all the Italian shoes there. So you've got yeah. Okay, Nitsha, describe yourself in three words. Oh, compassionate, purposeful, and I am love. Mm. Uh, what about you, Starling? Um, I would say I'm courageous, determined, and giving. Hmm. We got some hmm. bitching got girls some here. Awesome girls. One more? Okay, let's see. Oh, yes. Our last one is if you can see any band, living or dead, who would they be? Like tonight, we're going to a concert, get dressed up. Who would you want to go see? Uh, well, it's not a band, but Michael Jackson. I would love, oh, love to see. I got to see Janet when I, my mom took me to a Janet concert when I was like 12. It was Janet and Usher. It changed my life. So I would love oh, to see Janet and Usher. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's nice. 
Nice. What about you, Nitschka? I would like to see Beyonce. I oh. saw, um, oh, that energy, that energy. Um, come on, Tina Turner. Oh, yeah. Right here. Mm. And that energy was just awesome. I would like to see Beyonce because I've seen some video concerts of hers, but live, oh, that's what I would yeah, like to do. That would be amazing. That's wow, that's awesome. We that's would fun. all get along great. Yeah, good <laughs> stuff. You guys, thank you so much for the conversation today. This was as beautiful and enriching and um, informative, all the things I thought it might be. Uh, you guys brought a really cool dynamic just being mother and daughter and the generational thing. So thank you so much for sharing. And thank you for having us in the in the show notes um, about the Austin film. Is, is it the Austin film? Austin uh, Film Society. Yeah, the but I'll I'll, I'll send you the the link so people if they want to donate or they're interested in yes, finding out more all that stuff. We'll put it in there. Okay. Okay, guys. Well, have a really great night, and we thank will you. be in touch. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>